When it comes to Easter eggs and nods, nothing beats a prequel. Unless you wind up finding out that meth is made from midichlorians or something like that. Walter White may have found it so easy to sink into the dark and dirty underbelly of Albuquerque, New Mexico, because Slippin' Jimmy McGill had primed the pump as Saul Goodman. So many of the players and places that ended up as part of the rise and fall of Heisenberg were around for the rise of Saul Goodman and the fall of Jimmy McGill. Mr. Uh, Mayhew. Oh, look at you. Should I uh, call the FBI and tell them I found D.B. Cooper? <laughs> How much crossover is there exactly? Well, let's go ahead and dive right into it. Lalo Salamanca isn't so much an Easter egg as he is the happiest bad guy this side of Tuco when it comes to the Breaking Bad universe. Over the last seasons of Better Call Saul, Lalo is the smiling menace that haunts Jimmy in his transition to Saul Goodman until he finally kills Howard Hamlin and enlists Saul and Kim to kill his rival, Gus Fring. In a world of scary bad guys, he's scary enough that even Gus is unnerved by him. I've been an admirer of yours for many years. I come here on behalf of my entire family. Saul clearly doesn't get free of his terror, asking if Walt and Jesse were sent by him in his first appearance on Breaking Bad. According to creator Vince Gilligan, he had to be talked into including him by the writer's room, a decision that he's ultimately happy he made. Excellent! Before Walter White broke bad, Jesse was already ankled deep in badness as the meth dealer Captain Cook. You gotta have a cool nickname, I guess. Walter drugged the often reluctant Jesse to the big time, which meant leaving behind his Captain Cook persona. During Better Call Saul, though, when Saul makes a phone call, you can see that Jesse must already be in business as his Captain Cook tag decorates the payphone. Looking for businesses to launder his drug money, Walter suggested buying the car wash he rage quit in the first episode at the suggestion of Skyler. Trying to talk him out of the car wash and into the laser tag place, Saul gives Walter a lesson in being shady. Any lie will work as long as you believe the lie. To punctuate that, he mentioned the time when he hooked up with a woman by pretending to be Kevin Costner. What was a cheeky reference to Bob Odenkirk's passing resemblance to the Waterworld star became a true story when early in the first season we actually saw the woman he conned into thinking she was going home with the man who brought us the postman. You are not Kevin Costner was last night. A movie that I unironically enjoy and I will hear no bad words about it. Tom Petty's in it, it has to be good. By the end of Breaking Bad, things have, well, broken rather badly for just about everybody. That meant that Saul had to give up his lavishly shady lawyer lifestyle to go on the run. Before he could do that, he had to spend his last bit of time with the wrecking machine that was Walter White. When talking about his future, it's not Belize that he saw for himself, but a Cinnabon in Omaha, Nebraska. Best case scenario, I'm managing a Cinnabon in Omaha. Turned out he read the ticket, because when we pick up Saul post Breaking Bad in the bleak black and white future, he is indeed managing a Cinnabon in Omaha, Nebraska. Just because Saul, Walter, Fring, and company are epic levels of shadiness with ill intent, that doesn't mean that they are the only despicable people in Albuquerque. When Saul is introducing Kim to the dark side of working cons, their target is an arrogant stockbroker named Ken. Ken the stockbroker doesn't let being conned get to him though, because the next time he's seen, he's driving a BMW with the personalized plates, Ken wins. Being a typical BMW driver, he's a bit of a tool, and he wound up cutting into a parking spot that Walter was going for while waving him off and talking on his Bluetooth. Walter runs into him again at a garage still babbling into his Bluetooth, so Walter took the opportunity to bridge the connection on his car battery with a squeegee, setting it on fire. The engine that makes Breaking Bad go is the excuses Walter makes at each step of his journey that is meant to allow him to continue to think that he's still a good guy. The first step is the need for money to provide for his family after his untimely death from lung cancer. Being a man of science, Walter is extremely specific. So much so that he states that he needs exactly $737,000, which wound up not being enough. When Saul, as Gene, starts running a scam with the cab drivers that figure out who he is, one of the targets that almost restores Jimmy's conscience is a Mark who has cancer. When Jimmy goes to collect what the cabbie wouldn't, we find out that this cancer patient hasn't broke bad because he already had $737,000. The El Camino became the title of Jesse's follow-up movie that tracked his escape and eventual settlement in Alaska. In Better Call Saul, the El Camino dining room is a favorite place to meet clients for Kim Wexler, as well as a place to be told that Salamanca is still alive by a very stern Mike. Speaking of Mike, he's a man of simple habits. In both shows, he shows a preference for pimento cheese sandwiches, the caviar of the South. 
It's what he's carrying instead of a gun in the episode Pimento of Better Call Saul, and it's what he gives Jesse in Breaking Bad when he joins Mike on a stakeout. When not packing his own lunch, he spends his time at Loyola's family restaurant. Since butter won't melt in Saul's mouth, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the knee problem he brings up to avoid physical confrontation or labor is complete and utter bullcrap. All right, I'm gonna stand up, all right? Because I got bad knees. So... In an intimate moment with Walter that we see in the finale of Better Call Saul, we find out that he actually messed up his knee by going too hard on his first slip and fall scam. When Saul gives that as his one regret, Walter surmises that Saul has always been the way he is. So you were always like this. Something will wind up haunting him later. It's hard to believe in a world that has Walter White, Jesse Pinkman, Combo, Badger, and Skinny Pete, there is someone who is an even worse drug dealer, and it's not even close. That man is Daniel Warmel. He sells ill-gotten pharmaceuticals to Nacho and, not listening to Mike, is flashy with his cash. Naturally, that got his house tossed by Nacho and his baseball cards stolen. Apparently, Daniel recovers because he goes on to be the Danny, that Saul says makes his laser tag arena the best bet for money laundering. Either that or he's a psychic vampire named Colin Robinson. Real estate agent Stephanie Doswell shows Mike's daughter-in-law a new house that Mike sets up for her to move out of her bad neighborhood that she was living in. Later in Breaking Bad, the real estate agent had two run-ins with Hank's wife Marie, who was having her own Breaking Bad moment, stealing things from open houses until she was caught. Jesse and Walter never quite agreed on the best way to do business. One of their chief disagreements was actually where to do business. Walter chose a junkyard free from prying eyes, while Jesse stressed that prying eyes worked to their advantage. After complaining about the location, Walter asked him where they should be doing business, to which Jesse said that half of his business was conducted at Taco Cabeza because no one ever gets murdered at Taco Cabeza. Half the deals I've ever done went down at Taco Cabeza. Nice and public. Open 24 hours, nobody ever gets shot at Taco Cabeza. Turns out it's also a place for Kim and Saul to go to get some post shenanigans eats when Kim mentions that there's one right around the corner. Parking is good, and uh, Taco Cabeza is just around the corner. Jimmy's first law office leaves a lot to be desired as it's in the back of a nail salon located at 160 Guantabo Boulevard. There are two noteworthy things about that address. The first is that it's down the street from 6353 Wantaba Boulevard, the residence of Gail, the kindly chemist Gus tried to have replace Walt and Jesse. The other noteworthy thing about it is that the Day Spa and Nail is a real nail salon. That's a distinction that it actually shares with Loyola's family diner. When we meet Saul Goodman in Breaking Bad, he's a shady lawyer at the height of his powers. Better call Saul! <laughs> with splashy TV ads and his splashy 1997 Cadillac with custom plates that read, Lawyer Up. As a way to demonstrate that we'll be telling the story of Saul before the Cadillac, the first episode features a white 1997 Cadillac in a parking lot with Jimmy walking towards it, only to get in the ratty Suzuki esteem that indicates Jimmy's self-esteem might be in a bit of a rough shape. Because, you know, the name of the car is a feeling. I think I might be a genius for figuring that out. That's the spirit. One of the stranger things to get an origin story in Better Call Saul is the pink pig. In a Breaking Bad episode, Mike suspends the pig on a door to distract a would-be killer. And in Better Call Saul, we see that it's actually one of his granddaughter's toys. Attorneys are sticklers for rules, including rules that they are following technically, just so that they can argue they did all the things they should be doing if anything comes up in court. To this end, the kidnapped Saul asks Walt and Jesse to put a dollar each in his pocket so they are his clients and what they discuss is protected by client attorney privilege. It's the same thing that Kim does to become Jimmy's attorney in Better Call Saul. Much of Better Call Saul revolves around the house of Charles McGill, respected lawyer and judgmental brother of Jimmy. Three houses down and across the street, one Jesse Pinkman. The houses are in a neighborhood known as Country Club. You never want to be the officer who pulled over a master criminal for something small and then ended up letting them go. But sometimes there's no avoiding it. Even masterful criminals don't play their hands immediately. Officer Saxton is on the job taking a report from Daniel when his baseball cards were stolen because for some reason, he still wasn't listening to Mike. Later on, Officer Saxton took the police report for Skyler in season three of Breaking Bad when Walter broke into his house after being kicked out by Skyler. 
Ice Station Zebra is three things. It's a 1968 spy movie on a submarine and the titular research station, and the hunt for Russian spy photos taken with stolen technology. Ice Station Zebra is also the name of one of Saul's shell companies that he uses to shuffle money around. And uh, make it out to Ice Station Zebra Associates, that's my loan out. And in Better Call Saul, we also find out that it's Kim's father's favorite movie that she watches to think of it, which is actually really sweet. My dad loves this one. Sometimes production will hide things in shows or movies that they assume will just be for them. But if someone does discover it, they'll get a pretty special message. But this is the internet times, so when there was a hidden message in the episode titles for season two, the internet was able to really quickly decode the message everyone had been waiting for. The first letter of each episode spelled out Fring's back. Over the course of about a decade, Albuquerque managed to lose both their best legal minds and their worst legal minds one right after the other. Folks might want to try to stay out of trouble for a little bit. 